Well, as many of you know, we took the opportunity during the pandemic to upgrade some of our facilities on campus, including our chapel. The chapel is our original church building. It's where Church of the Palms got its start on this site. Actually, we got our real start in a funeral home, but that's another story. The chapel is where worship and Sunday school and fellowship and meetings all took place way back in 1959. It's been 25 years since any renovations have been made to that historic building, and so with the help and vision of the Geyer and Jackson families, we've transformed this important space into the next generation of sacred and beautiful. We encourage you to go over and take a look at it after worship anytime this summer. You'll find a new meeting room, new, new restrooms, and most of all, a beautiful chapel that accentuates the 12 beautiful stained glass windows, actually faceted stained glass windows to be precise, which were installed 25 years ago. So we thought we would seize the day, or should I say seize the summer, and preach a series on the 10 face, west-facing windows, each of which depict stories in the New Testament. We're calling this preaching series Windows on the Word, and we thought it might be an incentive for you to visit the chapel and see the windows, as well as ponder the stories that our congregation chose to highlight 25 years ago. So today we begin with what is called the education window, which you will find on the west facing wall of the narthex or lobby just outside the chapel. It adjoins the baptism window, which we will be looking at a few weeks down the road. The education window, which you will see featured on the cover of your bulletin, depicts a boy standing before a seated adult who is teaching him from a book, presumably the Hebrew scriptures. Above them is a symbol of an oil lamp, the symbol of divine wisdom. For the longest time, I took this to be the young boy Jesus learning from one of the elders in the temple. But when I found the original depiction of these windows, it turns out to be a depiction of the young boy Timothy. Timothy later became a protege of the Apostle Paul. The young boy Timothy standing before his mother Eunice. Now when you do a little digging into Timothy's family what you learn is that Eunice his mother was Jewish and his father whose name we don't know was Greek. So that we have way back when a biracial, biethnic, bi-religious, bicultural marriage, which would have been fairly scandalous in that first century. And then to make things a little bit more complicated, you have Eunice, Timothy's mother, and you have Lois, Timothy's grandmother, Eunice's mother, converting to an entirely new religion, Christianity. I can only imagine what kind of conversations went on in that household. But as we listen to these texts from 2 Timothy, hear what Paul is celebrating about the household of Timothy and Eunice and Lois and the education that took place there. So first from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I am grateful to God, Paul writes, whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And then later in the letter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Paul continues, now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing whom you, from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are, unable to inst that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, we pray, O Lord, that you allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. There is an old and chilling tale that has been recited throughout Europe since the 13th century about an old merchant who day by day grows more and more infirm. The old man's wife has long since passed away and he's miserably lonely. Fearing that he will soon lose his faculties, the old man decides to ask his middle-aged son and daughter-in-law if he might move in with their family out in the country. At first, the couple is overjoyed, for by way of compensation, the merchant promises to bequeath his small fortune to them before he dies. But as these things go, the old man becomes more and more difficult to care for, and more and more the family complains of all his demands, such that finally at dinner one night, after another round of whispered complaints, the farmer looks over to his son, and out of exhaustion and resignation says to the boy, take your grandfather out to the barn to live. Find him the best horse blanket, and wrap him in it to keep him warm. So the son takes his grandfather out to the barn and finds the best horse blanket. But before he wraps his grandfather in it, he tears it in two. He sets one half aside and wraps his grandfather with the other half. Later, when, he find, when his father finds out what the boy did, how he had thought to spare only half the horse blanket for his grandfather, he goes to the boy and scolds him. How could you do such a thing? What kind of boy would use only half a blanket to warm his grandfather? But father, the boy replies, I'm saving the other half for you. I told you it was a chilling tale, and one that raises the gravity of all the things that go on inside any home and what gets taught as a result. It's an enormous burden one accepts when one decides to become a parent because it is inside the home that the deeper spiritual and psychological and emotional lessons are learned, sometimes without our even knowing it. Often when I perform baptism counseling, I will discuss with mom and dad that whether they like it or not, what their children are learning from them is one, how to be human, and two, how to be a follower of Jesus. And as it turns out, our sons and daughters are learning more from what we do and less from what we say. Because one of the things we pick up pretty quickly in life is that each person ends up, what, what a person ends up doing tells you more than what, what a person ends up saying. Because of course anybody can say anything, just turn on the cable news or the Sunday preacher and you'll be convinced of that. Anybody can say anything. Like the old story of the bright young evangelist coming to town and he ends up talking to an old Amish man and at one point he asked the old Amish man, brother, are you saved? And the old Amish man paused for a second and said, that's an interesting question you asked there, young man. And the truth is I could tell you what you want to hear and it wouldn't mean a darn thing. Are you saved, you asked? Well, here are the names of my banker, my pastor, and my farmhands. You go ask them if I'm saved. So it's an interesting thing that the apostle brings to light about our friend Timothy, that somewhere along the way, his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice have been captured by the gospel. Bible doesn't say capture, but I wonder if it isn't the right word because, because it would have taken them being captured by this good news for them to boldly pursue the path of making this Jewish biracial household into a breeding ground for one of the church's great leaders, the young man Timothy. Theirs was not a perfunctory faith. They had become its very teachers. Lois and Eunice had some teaching to do, homeschooling, as it were, which meant that in some way the family had found its shape in the gospel. 
These strong women had a story to tell, and, and that's what most of early Christian teaching was, storytelling. They didn't have Bibles. They had stories about Jesus. They had stories about the prophecies of Israel. They had stories about the disciples, and you can only imagine what it was, that it was more than, that it was even more than the stories because little Timothy is looking for the connect between what they say and what they do. It's not that Eunice and Lois were necessarily all that skilled in pedagogy. It's that they likely practiced what they preached. Most of you know that I come from a long line of Presbyterian pastors, great-grandfather, grandfather, father, uncle, two brothers. I always say, talk about a dysfunctional family. So, so what's in the sauce? We often get that question. What was in the sauce? How, how did that happen? Was it because, you know, there was a line of great preachers, great teachers, great theologians, great church administrators, great pastors? Uh, maybe, maybe not. And people ask me, how is it that three sons follow their father into the ministry after I tell them that it was the only work we could get? I, I seriously tell them that it was, it was all about 6 p.m. 6 p.m. was when we sat down at the dinner table and at the dinner table is where we got reminded who was in charge of the McConnell household, and it wasn't the preacher. It was the five-foot-one-inch lady at the end, other end of the table. It was the one who made sure we did our homework, looked people in the eye, treated girls with respect, and said grace before picking up your fork. It was the one who sat down beside our beds and read us from Hurlbut's story of the Bible. It was the one who, along with our Father, loved us unconditionally, just like Jesus loved us unconditionally. The dots connected between what they said and what they did. Now, all those things don't necessarily make kids into preachers, but they have a good chance of making kids into human beings, and with the Spirit's help, followers of Jesus. And why not you? And you say, what do you mean, why not me? And I say, why not you, when it comes to finding the way to connect the dots between the stories of the Bible and the story of you? Why not you wondering if there still isn't a chance for you to shape the children of your life, the grandchildren of your life, the nieces and nephews of your life? Why, why not telling your own story or, or writing down your own story about what it means for you to be a child of God, to be loved by Jesus unconditionally, to connect the dots between what you say and what you do? Jimmy Carter said that he never much cared what his children thought of him. When you're a parent, you're often the bad guy. But he sure as heck cared what his grandchildren thought of him. So when my granddaddy was praying the Christmas prayer when Christmas Eve in church a long time ago, I'm not sure what thought he gave to that little 10-year-old boy, that would be me, sitting in the pew that night. The little 10-year-old boy who by some miracle kept his attention long enough to listen to the old white-haired man pray his prayer. And how the little 10-year-old listened and how it seemed to him that the old white-haired man seemed to be talking maybe to his best friend. It seemed to that little boy that the old man was talking to God and and that God was his best friend. And the impression never left the young boy that God could be your best friend. It was a deep impression because that's what happens with the malleable young. Deep impressions formed by what is said and what is done. Granddaddy wasn't around when I was ordained, but I would have liked to have told him that the whole thing got started with that prayer. And for you, maybe it's a reminder to your children and grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, that you're praying for them, or perhaps a word of grace when they sit with you at table. When Jimmy Stewart signed up for World War II after already establishing himself as a Hollywood star, it was his father who pulled him aside there in his little home in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and slipped into his breast pocket his transcription of the King James 91st Psalm. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall, not, shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. It was the best the father could think to give his boy as he went off to battle. On my desk, there is a government-issued New Testament handed out to all the boys who stormed the Normandy beaches on that day of all days, June 6, 1944, 77 years ago today. So in their back pockets or breast pockets, they carried with them the word of God. For some, it may have been just a good luck charm, but for others, like the member of our family that carried it on to the beaches on June 6, it was the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. So why not you? Why not you? Why leave it the chance that your children and grandchildren will figure it out on their own, how the dots connect between what you say and what you do, between what you believe and how you act? Many lives, remain to be impressed, deeply impressed. To our children and grandchildren, there are stories still to be told.